Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Robert Loss. I'm happy to join you again uh, for the uh, Sexy MF30 Symposium. Um, and I'm really excited to bring my Prince uh, love and scholarship into a uh, conversation with my comic scholarship and work that I do at CCAD. Um, and uh, it's just really kind of a, the best of both worlds for me. So I'm going to uh, present my... Um, PowerPoint here, and we'll get started. All right, so you really do think you're Batman, don't you? Says Gemini, a character implied to be Prince's alter ego, as the two race on motorcycles in a 1991 comic book titled Alter Ego. Despite this clever nod to Prince's recent real-world Batman soundtrack and videos, this comic book Prince is definitely an alter ego, too, not the least because he demonstrates serious hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. Prince's use of alternate identities dates back to at least Purple Rain, but the Batman project for the first time explored his aliases within the broader culture of comic book superheroes. We know Batman held a special place, um, for in Prince's heart, partly because the theme song to the campy 1960s Batman show was the first song that he learned to play uh, on the piano. <clears throat> in the Batman album and videos, Prince plays all the parts, Bruce Wayne, Batman, the Joker. And this was, in fact, I think a kind of radical move in 1989 when there were so few black superheroes in comic books and none in the films based on comic books. And there was always something a bit superheroic, superheroic about Prince. His complex, enigmatic public identities from Camille to Tora Tora suggested the multiple, even secret identities uh, that we associate with the superhero genre. I dare you to look at this uh, uh, poster from the Love Sexy era and not see the superhero team that we needed and deserved from Marvel or DC circa 1988. And as I thought about this presentation, it occurred to me that three song titles from the Love Symbol album that we're here to celebrate, the Max, the Continental, and even the Flow, could be pretty good superhero names. Pretty good. So, <clears throat> excuse me, today I'll be talking about two comic books that depict Prince in a heroic mode. Though he's without literal superpowers in each, Prince is nonetheless an ass-kicking adventure hero uh, skilled in martial arts or hand-to-hand -hand combat. Part of what makes these comics interesting is the, uh, what they show us about how others perceived Prince's range of public and artistic personas circa 1991 to 1994, and especially the perception of one person, Dwayne McDuffie, who wrote Alter Ego and Three Chains of Gold, uh, which is a 1994 retelling of the Love Symbol album and home videos narrative. McDuffie was an incredibly important comics writer who worked for Marvel and DC, but more importantly, uh, went on to co-found Milestone Comics in 1993. Milestone was an independent company owned by black comics artists that published stories about a diverse cast of black superheroes and superheroes of color. In other words, both of these Prince comics were written by a black creator whose creative and entrepreneurial work pushed the comic book industry forward. And for that reason, I'm interested in situating Alter Ego and Three Chains of Gold in the context of the comics medium and industry. So <clears throat> historically, um, the genre of superhero comics has excluded and marginalized black superheroes. It wasn't until 1966 that the Black Panther appeared for the first time in Marvel's Fantastic Four number 52. And uh, not until uh, 1973 did he feature in his own series. Marvel debuted the first African-American superhero Falcon in uh, Captain America 117 in 1969, uh, in which he helped bring down a group of Nazis working with the Red Skull. And in 1971, Jon Stewart appeared as a new Green Lantern, uh, becoming DC Comics' first black superhero. A more problematic run of characters capitalized on the black exploitation movement in American film, typified by the original incarnation of Marvel's um, Luke Cage, a hero for hire who appeared in 1972 for the first time. Like the protagonists of films like Shaft and Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, 
both released in 1971, Luke Cage was a smooth-talking hustler from the inner city, setting a trend that would continue with superheroes like the futuristic Tyrock in DC's The Legion of Superheroes, Misty Knight, Black Goliath, Black Lightning, and even a retcon version of the Falcon who, instead of being a social worker, was now a street-level criminal. Two things I want to point out here. First of all, um, all of these characters were created, written, and drawn at this time by white comics industry folks uh, from Black Panther's creator Stan Lee and Jack Kirby to Len Wein and Dave Cockrum, who created Storm, the influential uh, African superhero who was introduced in the pages of Giant Size X-Men number one in 1975. That panel was not from that issue. Let's just say that the intricacies of African and African-American culture and politics were decidedly lost on these well-meaning white authors. <clears throat> Secondly, I want to draw your attention to the way that this timeline overlaps with Prince's life. When the Black Panther debuted in 1966, Prince was eight years old. Though, of course, I can't confirm that Prince read any of the comics that I've just mentioned. It seems plausible that he did. And that, like many young black men, these stories might have played some role in the shaping of his identity. This is significant because, as you may have noticed, nearly all of the characters I just listed were black men. In his study of Milestone Comics, um, Jeffrey Scholar, uh, sorry, Jeffrey Brown, a scholar, notes that traditionally the male superhero with a double identity represents a hypermasculine ideal of strength and power that is meant to be integrated with a quote unquote softer masculinity one that's intellectual, empathetic, socially concerned, and so on. However, historically, the male, uh, the black male has been represented in media as being, quote, this is a direct quote from Brown, being too hard, too physical, too bodily, while also being denied masculine powers such as fatherhood, ownership, and leadership. He cites the scholar Kabina Mercer, who claims that, quote, shaped uh, by the history of slavery and racism, black masculinity is a highly contradictory form of identity as it is a subordinated masculinity. And you can see the whole quote there that Brown um, uh, cites. So Brown then goes on to say, if comic book superheroes represent an acceptable, albeit obviously extreme model of hypermasculinity, and if the black male body is already culturally ascribed as a site of hypermasculinity, well, then the combination of the two, a black male superhero, runs the risk of being read as an overabundance, a potentially threatening cluster of masculine signifiers. Brown's book is a study of Milestone Comics' fans, and he finds that black readers especially appreciate how the comics, how the company's black male characters are written in a way that, as Brown describes it, quote, puts the mind back into the body, the Clark Kent back into the Superman. In other words, <clears throat> Milestone affords black male superheroes the integration of ethics and intellect with strength and courage, an integration historically denied to characters such as Luke Cage and so forth. So this is just one way that Dwayne McDuffie and his Milestone co-founders, Michael Davis, Derek T. Dingle, and Dennis Cowan, rewrote and challenged cultural norms about blackness in their comics. After years of planning, Milestone launched in 1993 with four titles. You can see them all there. For some reason, I don't. I thought I had the static first issue, but I don't. Uh, Hardware, Static, Icon, and Blood Syndicate. Although the titles were distributed by DC Comics, the company had no official editorial control over Milestone's editors, writers, and artists, giving the Milestone team a significant amount of freedom. Um, each series grounded black protagonists and antagonists in predominantly black communities and families. These characters were diverse in age, politics, and philosophy. For example, over, um, I hope it appears for you on the left, um, Icon, often derided as the black Superman, uh, was a nearly immortal alien who, was, uh, who as a child landed on a plantation and was raised by an enslaved black woman. And yet his politics today, in the present moment, bolstered by his self-made wealth over many generations, skew towards the conservative. In her essay on McDuffie's revival of the Marvel uh, character Deathlock, seen there on the right, Lisa Rivera writes, quote, Deathlock reimagines blackness as a complex diasporic cultural production. 
not an essential naturalized or fixed identity. And I think we can, and end quote, and I think we can apply that almost verbatim to what McDuffie achieved with Milestone Comics and with the two Prince comics that we're going to take a look at here. So let me talk briefly about Alter Ego, which was published by the DC imprint Piranha Comics in 1991. It's worth noting that DC was and is still, of course, owned by Warner Brothers. Published as a standard 22-page floppy, um, it's written by McDuffie and penciled by Dennis Cowan, another co-founder of Milestone. In an interview with the Comics Journal earlier this year, Cowan recalls that the special issue, quote, came about because Prince was coming out with the new album and he was with the Warner's bro Warner Brothers label, end quote. Despite not knowing whose idea the comic was, Cowan remembers that Prince approved his sample drawings and that Prince approved everything. That's a direct quote. Excuse me. With a back cover featuring a Diamonds and Pearls promo image, the comic nonetheless harkens back to the plot and themes of Graffiti Bridge. Aura is here renamed Muse, but remains a mysterious ethereal character or archetype. However, the plot mostly concerns Gemini, who represents Prince's polar opposite, which is the Times role in the film. But while the Times crass commercialism and violence in the film are means of achieving dominance, for Gemini, music is the means, and hatred and anarchy are his goals. A former neighborhood friend of Prince's, he's enormous, unrefined, and just as primal as Muse, which turns into an interesting plot point when we discover Muse has been working with Gemini all along just before she saves Prince from a guitar rig to electrocute him and sacrifices herself. <clears throat> so, as in Graffiti Bridge, most of the action takes place in Seven Corners at Glam Slam, and in the final showdown, Prince frees the people and the MPG from Gemini's spell, not through brawn, but uh, through brains, and musical acumen. Prince knows that music has other attributes, subtler ones than Gemini failed to discern. McDuffie's third-person narration states, riffing off Gemini's angry solo, subverting its ragged energies, transforming them. Take a look at that passage right there. So in the end, Prince stops the now liberated crowd from destroying Gemini because as the improbably still alive muse argues, <laughs> you can't defeat evil by becoming it. Prince says she's right. Let him go. The only power he has is what we give him. Allegorically here, <clears throat> Prince makes peace with his more destructive side in a very Zen way. Acknowledge it so it doesn't hold power over you. You hold power over it. This also calls to mind lyrics from, calls to mind lyrics from My Name is Prince. I know from Righteous. I know from Sin. I got two sides and they're both friends. And in fact, the Three Chains of Gold comic features Prince performing these uh, those lyrics in the first several pages. You can see that there on the slide. Mark Singer was the first comic scholar to apply W.E.B. Um, w. Du Bois' famous concept of double consciousness to black superheroes and specifically the all-important motifs of masks and secret identities. Singer writes, the idea of the split identity, one of the most definitive and distinctive <clears throat> distinctive traits of the superhero is also one of the most powerful and omnipresent figures used to illustrate the dilemmas and experiences of minority identity. Thus, black superheroes' dual identities may express how, as Dubois described it in 1903, one ever feels his twoness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body. Which is real, the self under the mask, the masked self, or both? In Alter Ego, Gemini can be understood as a symbolic manifestation of Prince's mask, this doubleness. We might even understand Gemini as the hyper-masculine, quote-unquote, untamed black man seen as a threat by white society. So it's important that Prince doesn't reject or destroy Gemini, but rather subdues him. He embraces his own two-ness while keeping its elements in the proper balance. I discuss this at length because in Three Chains of Gold, 
uh, which again was uh, published in 1994, Prince doesn't struggle with the many sides of his identity at all. He's a confident, smooth hero, as lithe and romantic as he was in real life, a man whose strengths still come from his local roots and friends, his intellect and savoir faire, and his commitment to morality and justice. Only now the story unfolds globally, most of it happening in what McDuffie describes at the very beginning as Erech, somewhere in the Middle East. And in fact, Erech was an ancient Mesopotamian city in southern Iraq. Prince is once again a cosmopolitan figure, less of the trickster he played in Under the Cherry Moon, but still quite recognizably Prince. Three Chains of Gold was also published by the Piranha imprint. In fact, it was the last comic produced for the imprint before DC shifted focus to the moodier and more popular Vertigo line. Although the comic wasn't published until 94, we're face to face here, of course, with the transmedia story of the Love Symbol album and videos. And I have to say, as far as the story goes, this is by far the most coherent and satisfying of the three. It almost has to be, given the nature of the comics medium and the fact that this is a 48 page comic. McDuffie um, employs some key plot differences that I want to go over real quick. In the home video collection, Princess Maite comes to Prince already possessing all three uh, pieces of the ancient heart artifact, whereas in the comic, she only has one piece. The artifact itself is the love symbol broken into three pieces, the circle, the horn, and the arrow. And in the comic, uh, Maite's uncle uh, Tammuz kills her father, not mysterious goons. With the assistance of her bodyguard, Raj, uh, in the comic book, Maite connects with Prince, escapes to the U.S., and in the biggest plot difference, they must return to the ancient pyramid, the Tomb of Gilgamesh, to find the hidden chain. We'll see that in a second. There is no vaguely Afrofuturistic city, as in the Seven video, no dancing children, and neither do the bad guys look like Prince. They are unfortunately somewhat Orientalist depictions of men from the vague sort of Middle East. Partly thanks to the story's length, here the members of the New Power Generation have much more to say and do than in Alter Ego. Levi and Tony M. crack wise. At one point, Michael B. welds a baseball bat. Though that's sort of a misdirect because he says, yeah, I know a better game. All right, I'm down with that, says Levi. And then they're in the next page, they're getting ready to play uh, softball. And they all rain down gunfire <laughs> on the uncle's pursuing army while Maite and Prince sneak into the tomb. And best of all, my favorite sequence, because Sonny Thompson is one of my favorite Prince musicians, Sonny Thompson has to take over and fly a plane, crash landing it near the pyramid. It is fun stuff, more comic booky in many ways, from the brighter colors to the cleaner line work and the increased presence of the MPG evokes the superhero team. But the band also represents Prince's ties to Minneapolis, and crucially, all the members are black men with the exception of Tommy Barbarella. Wisdom, ethics, and spirituality, Prince always instructed us, are necessary counterbalances to physical and sexual energy. McDuffie demonstrates here, as he would go on to do in Milestone Comics, how black men searching for wholeness and balance should not look to hegemonic white myths and representations of blackness for the answers, but instead look to their own communities, look to their friends, look to the people that stand by them and with whom they, they uh, get, well, get into some fun adventures as well. Additionally, I think for as ridiculous as this adventure is, it's very refreshing that a predominantly black team of adventurers gets to have fun in a comic book. I literally cannot think of a single comic I've read ever in which that happens, except for Milestone Comics. The adventures weren't ridiculous, but McDuffie and the Milestone creative team never shied away from oversized action, mysterious plots, dangerous tech, garish costumes, so many things that make uh, superhero comics what they are. McDuffie's vision for Milestone was very clear, and one uh, common feature of his stories was a resolution that didn't rely on an out-and-out -out brawl. Rather than espousing, this is a direct quote, rather than espousing a reductionist, hyper-masculine, might-makes-right norm, uh, says uh, Jeffrey Brown, Milestone series continually depict heroism, heroism as a matter of intelligence first and power second, showing that, in fact, intelligence is the greatest power of them all. And I would argue myself that this is as true in the Prince comics uh, as it is in Milestone comics. In Three Chains of Gold, Prince's wit and intellect are always on full display, and when action is needed, he moves like a cat, um, using thinking, quick thinking, rather than sheer power to subdue his opponents. Though in one sequence there's uh, that's an exception to this rule, McDuffie marries the Max to Prince's action hero moves. 
the uh, comics finale is perhaps a better example. Prince uh, and Maite discover the missing relic, <clears throat> excuse me, the arrow on the skeleton of a king, only to be confronted by her uncle Tammuz. Foolishly, <clears throat> Tammuz snatches the arrow for himself. A laser beam hidden inside the rib cage shoots out, bouncing off the miniature love symbol uh, Prince has been wearing throughout the story and hitting Tammuz, killing him. It's interesting to note that Prince's relationship with the fictional Maite is a little more chaste in the comic than it is in the album and videos. It's definitely romantic and sexual, but with more gallantry than desire. Prince here is a knight, and at the end of the story, he rejects Maite's offer of marriage and insists that she keep all the pieces of the symbol and her kingdom, which are rightfully hers. I'm not going to say she's a compelling character here, but she is less sexualized and exoticized, uh, less exoticized in the comic. Um, interestingly, when asked uh, during that comics journal interview about drawing Alter Ego in 1991 with, uh, with, with Dwayne McDuffie, Dennis Cowan sort of a bit surprised by the date and he replies i associate prince more with milestone i find that to be a very poignant comment because as i've researched this topic i've come to think that there was an affinity between Dwayne mcduffie and prince they each valued intellect and compassion but neither felt that those qualities reduced what masculinity meant for black men they each valued independence but retained strong beliefs in love and community and they each refused to essentialize black subjectivity according to racist norms that so often depict blackness as self-motivated, hyperphysical, hypersexualized, or sub subordinated to whiteness in comic books and in society in general. Dwayne McDuffie died an untimely death in, in uh, 2011 at the age of 49, but like Prince, his legacy lives on. After diversifying into a media company, Milestone had ended its comics in 1997 uh, with his characters eventually joining the DC Universe. McDuffie went on to write for and produce uh, animated series, uh, most notably Static Shock, the first time a black superhero was the titular hero of his own animated series, and Justice League, which for a new generation defined Jon Stewart as the Green, as the Green Lantern. McDuffie's legacy is the creation of new black superheroes by, comic, by black comics creators. And I think Prince has a small but important place in that progressive reimagining. Thank you very much.